Happy Wednesday, everybody. It's our time we call Coffee with PC, and I'm telling you, this time change thing is killing me. I have been worn out, so definitely need a cup of coffee with a shot of espresso in there. Man, it has been a, a crazy few days. I don't know if it's affected you, but it certainly has messed me up. I just can't seem to get acclimated to this new time change. I hope you're having an easier time. And, and I do like that it's light later. It's just messed me up. I don't quite understand it, uh, but we do it every year a couple times. And so here we are again, losing that hour of sleep and trying to make up for it. Again, coffee, a good help along the way. I appreciate you spending these few minutes with me. Sorry to open with kind of a little belly ache in there, but nonetheless, we try to spend these few minutes talking about something in the Bible that, that has jumped out at me. And lately we've been wandering through the book of Matthew, seeing different places in Jesus's ministry that one of his disciples, he Matthew, he recorded it for us. He was one who followed Jesus. We saw that in chapter nine of this book. He left his tax collector business to become a disciple or a follower of Jesus. And so he records for us things that Jesus said and did that help us hopefully come to understand and know Jesus better. We're all the way in Matthew chapter 12, so we're not quite halfway through uh, this account of the life of, of Jesus that Matthew put together. But there's a really interesting uh, couple of verses I wanted to look at today in Matthew chapter 12. Jesus says something uh, particularly interesting. Now, as, as we've gone through, and I know we haven't hit every story, every account of everything Jesus has done, but when you think about the ministry of Jesus, you think of a few things. One thing you think of is probably his teaching ministry. We did look at several parts of the longest section of any sermon we have of his recorded, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, three whole chapters of Matthew. So when you think about Jesus, you might think about the things he taught or that he said. And another thing you might think about Jesus, and these were the ones that were very much attention getting, are his miracles. All of the people that came into contact with him and that they received a, a, an incredible gift of a miracle from Jesus, whether it was a healing like somebody that was blind or the centurion servant, whether it was a demon possession that Jesus would take the demon out of, whether it was one we looked at where Jesus had control over nature, where he calmed the storm and his disciples were just amazed. Now you can imagine the, the, uh, well, the news that would spread about those kind of events. When Jesus would perform these miracles, as we see throughout all these accounts of his life, people would flock to him uh, because it was, it was unusual. It was, it was spectacular even. And some of those people that would come around Jesus turned out not to be so much interested in who he was and what he had to say as much as they were threatened by him, particularly the religious leaders, because as Jesus was drawing a crowd, he was drawing it away, we might say, from the, the religion of the people of Israel and their religious leaders. And so at one point uh, in Matthew chapter 12, the, the Pharisees and teachers of the law, so these would be the religious leaders, these would be the, the people that were at the temple and that, that oversaw that, uh, oversaw the priesthood, oversaw the sacrificial system, and were, were steeped in the scriptures, the law that they were, that were given to the people of Israel through God on Mount Sinai. And they come to Jesus and they ask for something interesting. They say in verse 38 of Matthew 12, teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. Now, that's a fascinating question because Jesus had already performed some miracles. So this is kind of like your miracle on demand request. Hey, Jesus, we want you to prove yourself. If you're really who you say you are. Now, they don't say it that way, but I think there's a little bit of that undercurrent. Um, maybe they're hoping if they ask him to perform a sign and he can't, it might hurt his popularity. That, that if he can't you know, perform on demand, uh, well, then maybe the people will think, well, maybe he's not all he's cracked up to be. I, I don't know if that's it. I don't know how, how, well, how genuine this request is. Are they really interested in learning who Jesus is? Or are they just trying to, to maybe, as they would do often, as Matthew continues to show us as he tells the rest of the story of the life of Jesus, is that were they continually trying to kind of trap Jesus in a way that would make him look bad? And, and because of what happens, I think mostly that was what they were doing. But, but in this case, they asked Jesus to do 
a miraculous sign. And, and Jesus' answer is, is really interesting. He says, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign. Whoa. So he starts off pretty strong, right? Starts off pretty saucy. Um, he's talking to Pharisees and religious leaders, the people who pride themselves on being uh, obedient to the law of God. And he says it's the wicked and adulterous generation who want a sign. So he's calling the, the religious leaders in so many words, wicked and adulterous. He's kind of smacking them around a little bit. He's, he's not exactly winning friends and influencing people as the book title of a few decades ago went. He says, that's who asked for a sign. He says, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah, the prophet. Now, that's an interesting reference, isn't it? Jonah is an Old Testament story, a Hebrew Bible story. It's a short prophetic book. If you're familiar with the story, a lot of people know the story because we often say Jonah got swallowed by the whale. It's kind of the, the way that, that it's, it's fit in our mind. It's maybe as a kid's story or whatever, and that, that, that's kind of what happens. Jonah is a prophet of God who God asked to go to the city of Nineveh, which is Assyria, which is an enemy of Israel. Jonah was supposed to go to the enemy city and preach to them, and he didn't want to, as you would expect. They were the enemy, and so he decides to run the other way, thinking, I'm not going to do what God calls me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do and not specifically go the opposite way of what God calls me to do. He gets on a boat headed across the Mediterranean Sea away from Assyria, and while he's on the boat, a storm comes up, and the, the sailors that he's on the boat with are panicking until he admits the reason the storm has come up is because he's on board, and he tells them, throw me overboard, and it'll be fine. They throw Jonah overboard. The, the, the storm kind of calms down, but that next thing in the story is Jonah is swallowed by, the, the text usually says, a great fish. We usually say whale, but great fish swallows Jonah. And, and it's a remarkable thing, and he's in the belly of the fish, for several days, three days, Jesus says here, he says, for, it, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three nights and three days in the heart of the earth. So he uses Jonah's experience for three days and three nights in the belly of the fish before the, the fish kind of vomits him up. That's a, a horrible thing to say, but that's what happened. Vomits him up on dry ground. And of course, you know what happens if you know the story. After the fish deposits him on dry ground, he goes to Nineveh and does what God has told him. Because listen, if I had done the opposite of what God told me to do and he sent a big fish to swallow me and I survived in the belly of a great fish for three days, which can't be a pleasant experience, let's be honest. And, and I don't even know how that's possible um, with all that would normally happen, but it does in, in the miraculous nature of God. He, and he goes and he preaches to Nineveh. And Jesus says, this generation, the wicked and adulterous generation, these religious leaders and Pharisees who ask him, will be given a sign, but it's the sign of Jonah. And, and you see how he makes the three days and three nights, and we think of, especially with Easter around the corner, what's in our mind? The, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, right? Jesus dies. He, we, we talk about three days later, he rose from the grave. So you, we have that kind of ingrained in our minds and thinking, particularly as we're just a few weeks from Easter. And he says, that's the sign of Jonah that's going to be given to this generation, that just as Jonah was three days and three nights, so the Son of Man is going to be three days, in this case, in the grave. Now, now it's a fascinating sign. One of the things that's, that he goes on to say, and he kind of really twists and, and comes at him hard after calling him wicked and adulterous, which isn't bad enough, he says, listen, you need to also know that the people of Nineveh, when they're at the judgment with you, well, they're going to condemn you because the problem is the people of Nineveh repented and no one, no one of you has repented, even though someone greater than Jonah, meaning Jesus, has come along. It's really quite the rebuke. It's really quite a harsh response to their question, show us a sign. Um, but, but you can see he's, he's really twisting. He's really, he's really turning the screws to him. He's saying, look, the people of Nineveh, who were, as I said, Assyrians, who were not the people of God, like the Jewish people were, who were a foreign and pagan country, when Jonah comes and preaches, they repent. They put on sackcloth and ashes, the whole city, starting with the king on down, the whole area does, and they repent, and God does not destroy them. Jonah, or excuse me, Jesus says, they repented, and you're a wicked and adulterous. You're not going to repent. It's going to be worse for you than it was for them. It's, it's an interesting story. So, so why does he say the sign of Jonah? And I think this is really an interesting thing. And here, here's the point I was, I was building toward. 
The sign of Jonah, there, there's an irony behind it. Because what I think Jesus is, is getting at, whether they understood it or not, is that the sign of Jonah would come for them, his three days in the heart of the earth, would come after they've already rejected him. See, they wanted a sign, if, if we're taking pure motives, if we're assuming pure motives, which I don't know if we can, but let's do that for a minute. They really wanted to know, is Jesus who he said he is? Is he really the Messiah, the Son of God? These were Jewish religious leaders who knew about Messiah, who knew the prophecies of Messiah, who saw this miracle worker, authoritative teaching rabbi, Jesus, going around. And, and so let's assume for a minute there was a legitimate question. If you're really the Messiah, show us a sign. And Jesus is saying, the sign you're going to get is going to be down the road. And the, the problem with the sign of Jonah isn't that it's not a miraculous sign because any resurrection from the dead is pretty doggone miraculous. I mean, our whole faith as Christians is built on Jesus rising from the dead. It's, it's transformational that he came back from the dead. It's this fact in history that we point to that's the basis for our faith. The Bible says if he is not raised, our faith is in vain. So it's pretty huge. It's a big miracle he's going to do. But the point of the sign of Jonah for these religious leaders is it's too late. Because by the time they get the sign of Jonah, they will have already decided to not repent, to not believe in him, to betray him, to plot to have him arrested, to remove him as a threat to their sway over the people and they'll have done all of these things which will even have a moment where they'll cry out for Jesus's crucifixion and the release of a prisoner Barabbas who was a, a, a pretty violent fellow who deserved the, the punishment Jesus didn't they would cry out crucify Jesus they would turn their backs on him they would betray him they would ultimately be a part of the mob that called for his death and it was only after they had rejected him that finally he would give him a sign it would be, as I said a minute ago, too late. And I think about that. Um, and it, first of all, I think about it from the sense of the way Jesus uses the Old Testament scriptures and uses them with people who know them better than anybody of the day to show them they really don't quite understand what they should understand is humbling. It, it, it's remarkable. And it reminds me, as much as I study and as much as I learn, there's still so much I have to learn and so much I need to know and so much more that God can show me as I grow and mature in him. But it's also a reminder that, you know, people every day make decisions about Christ. Every day they'll decide. And particularly, as I've said, with Easter around the corner and, and where we'll proclaim in, in a big day of celebration, his death for our sins and his resurrection from the grave, people even today, even next week, even Easter Sunday are going to be confronted with the truth that they'll reject. And the question is, will they finally believe when it's too late? I, I, I think that's a hard thing to think about. Um, I think that's, that's a hard truth Jesus threw out at these folks back then, but it's one that echoes through a couple of thousand years of history and reminds me of the great privilege we have of reminding people of this sign of Jonah. The beauty of it for, the, for them, for, for us, I should say, is it's already happened and it's not too late. For, for these who rejected him and were part of the mob calling for his crucifixion, it might have been too late, but for us, it's not. We can look back in faith and in, in rejoicing at what God has done through Jesus and see the sign of Jonah as that which calls us. You know, who, who else, what other religious leader has done what Jesus has done, not just in the miracles he performed, but himself loving us enough to die for our sins and then, ha and then God victoriously raising him from the grave showing that he accepted that punishment for our sins so that we might be forgiven. I am so grateful for the gift of Jesus. And I'm looking forward to celebrating his life and his death and his burial and his resurrection over these next couple of weeks, two and a half weeks till Easter. Remind you again, love to have you join us. Um, we're going to start next Saturday, the 23rd. We have a big kids event. It's not an Easter egg hunt. It's an Easter egg decorating party with a, with a, a, a bounce house, some snow cones, cotton candy. We'll have a petting zoo here. Have a lot of fun for the kids. The 23rd from 430 to 630. And then Good Friday, 7 o'clock, we'll have our Good Friday service as we remember 
his death on the cross. And then Easter Sunday morning, we'll be at Penny Camp Park, 6.45 a.m., celebrating the resurrection. That Jesus, yeah, the sign of Jonah, he was in the, the, the heart of the earth for three days, but he rose again. And because of his resurrection, we have life. I would love to have you join us for any or all of those things as we celebrate who Jesus is and what he has done. And I'd love the opportunity to tell you more about what he means to me and about what he can mean for you if you'll turn to him in faith. So plan to join us or even reach out. Send me an email, reply to this video and say, hey, I wanna know more and I'd love the opportunity to connect and talk with you about the the hope that we have and the life and forgiveness that's found in Jesus Christ. Well, I'm gonna go finish my cup of coffee. I, I might, don't tell, I might get another one a little bit later to get me through the afternoon. But I hope your day is going well. And I thank you again for spending just a couple of minutes with me. I'll let you get back after it. And I hope to see you in worship or if not next Wednesday as we check in together.